So good evening, everyone. I'm Hannah from the Blue Hill Public Library, and I just wanted to welcome everyone and thank you all for coming out tonight for this talk by Mike Coffin. Um, Dr. Mike Coffin has generously done these fascinating lectures for us here at the library. Has it been for the last three years or four years? It's been a while. Mike's a, a fan favorite who comes back every summer for us. Uh, but this is the first time we're doing it in this format, so I appreciate everybody coming out from uh, all over the world. And um, just to share a little bit about Mike, he's a marine geophysicist at the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies in Hobart, Tasmania, and also um, spends his uh, summer times in this hemisphere in Surrey, uh, a lot of it out on the water. And um, I'm going to hand it over to Mike to tell us some more about uh, human exploration of the deep sea. Thanks, Hannah. <clears throat> and welcome, everyone. I extend my thanks to you for joining me on this, uh, this evening. I hope everyone can see my slides. C can you, Hannah, Hannah? Yeah, it looks good to me. I think we're good. OK. I'm going to talk about the general topic is human exploration of the deep sea, and I'm going to recount some of my experiences on the ocean floor. I mainly, though, however, study from the surface and use remote sensing, but I've had the opportunity to go to the ocean floor in a submersible, and I'll talk a bit about that. When I did that, I was working at the University of Tokyo, so that's why these, this slide template is the University of Tokyo, not my current institutions which are University of Tasmania, the University of Maine, and the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. The latter two I have adjunct and visiting positions at, and which for, I'm extremely grateful for. So an outline of my presentation, I'm gonna talk a bit about submersible, or <clears throat> these are what we call submarines that take people down to do research, their development of their um, <clears throat> the technology, uh, provide an overview of those submersibles or human occupied vehicles as we call them now that, that can dive deeper than 4,000 meters or about two and a half miles. Um, I'll talk first about those that are used for research purposes um, and I'll talk in detail about the one that I've been in the Japanese Shinkai 6500. And then a couple of high net worth individuals have commissioned to have built their own submersibles that have gone to the deepest places in the oceans. And throughout this presentation, I'm gonna make some analogies with NASA and other space agency exploration, because there are a lot of analogies between exploring the very deep sea, <clears throat> more than a few thousand meters, and exploring space and planets and moons. So what I'm trying to combat in this talk is this view of these lovely ladies sitting around having tea I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean, but I don't. Uh, the bottom of the ocean is a fascinating place. I'll try to convince you of that. Um, <clears throat> and I hope these prove these ladies wrong. First, what is an HOV versus an ROV versus an AUV? So we call them human occupied vehicles, uh, the ones that submersibles that go to the ocean floor, as opposed to remotely operated vehicles or ROVs, which don't have people in them. But those are linked to a support ship or a mother vessel with a cable of some sort, fiber optic or power cable. And then there are AUVs, which are on autonomous undersea vehicles. Those don't have people in them either, but those aren't tethered. They're like robots we send to Mars or the moon um, <clears throat> without any physical connection to anything else. So people first, the first recorded uh, interest in going underwater to any great depth was remarked upon by Aristotle in the fourth century BC. And in fact, Alexander the Great, um, there are drawings of him going down in a diving bell, and I'll show you a picture of a diving bell later. It started to get serious in the Middle Ages and 1500s, a couple of Italians dove uh, <clears throat> in a lake in Italy using a one person diving bell. And in the 1600s and 1700s, uh, diving bells improved, the technology improved, and they were used mainly for salvaging uh, vessels that sank. So here on the left, we have Alexander the Great going down in a glass um, diving bell in the 
fourth century BC. That's a rendition of him from the Middle Ages. And on the right, you can see why it's called a diving bell, because it looks like a bell and a person's just inside it. You can see a, a mannequin's feet sticking out the bottom of that one. And you're just lowered over the side, maybe a few tens of meters uh, to get to whatever target you are aiming for. Now, submarines came along a bit later. In 1776, we saw the first submarine to attack another ship. It was called a turtle. It was a British invention. And then similarly in 1800, the submarine Nautilus was built by an American, Robert Fulton. And from the 1800s onward, there were many, many submarines built. And the difference between a submarine and a submersible, submersibles are pretty small. Um, they don't go anywhere distant on their own power. They're taken by a mothership, whereas submarines are pretty autonomous these days. People started to want to get deeper and deeper in the ocean. So a device called a bathysphere was invented in 1930 by a couple of Americans. This was lowered from a ship by a cable. And in 1934, it set a real depth record, almost a thousand meters off Bermuda. Um, so a technological advance. And that's a picture. Um, if you can imagine going down <clears throat> a thousand meters in that thing, you know, you're braver than I am. Then the same engineer developed something called a benthoscope in 1930. Again, it didn't have any power and it was loaded from, lowered from the ship by cable. And in 1949, it set, set a record of nearly 1400 meters and that's still a record for that kind of device. And that's a picture of the benthoscope. So 4,500 feet or about 1500 meters. Mm -hmm. Again, brave people went down in devices like that. Finally, in the late 1940s, following World War II, <clears throat> a series of vehicles was built by the Belgian Auguste Picard. And <clears throat> these were self-propelled and free diving. So for the first time, um, going really deep in a vehicle that could move on its own and was not tethered to the surface in any way. And in 1960, the, that Trieste um, made it to the bottom of Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench, just southeast of Guam, the island of Guam in the Western Pacific. Two people were in this um, Trieste, Jacques Picard and Don Walsh. Don Walsh, uh, still alive, is a, is a US Navy veteran. Um, so the pressure at that depth is about a thousand times the pressure at sea level. So these vehicles have to be extremely strong um, you can't spring a leak because that would mean instant death. That's a picture of the Trieste, um, <clears throat> somewhere in tropical regions, probably in Guam. Um, at the very bottom of it uh, is where the two people were, and then the rest of it is flotation, propulsion, ballast, etc. And a cross section of that. Um, <clears throat> So gasoline was the major form of buoyancy in these. So <laughs> don't light a match around these vehicles. They also had water ballast. And again, down at the bottom is where the two um, observers were. This is a summary slide of active vehicles uh, that can dive deeper than 4,000 meters. So 4,000 meters is at this level in this diagram. Um, the most famous of these is the Alvin, which is operated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Up until this year, it had a capability of going 4,500 meters. Um, it's being refit as we speak. Um, and next year, it'll go into service 6,500 meter capability. France built one called the Nautil or Nautilus, like in Jules Verne's novels, um, that can go to 6,000 meters. Japan has one that can go to 6,500 meters. Um, China built one <clears throat> that can go to 7,200 meters. And then more recently, private individuals have built vehicles that can go to the greatest ocean depths, um, almost 11,000 meters. I'm not gonna talk about these two Russian vehicles, Kalita or Consul. Those belong to the Russian Navy. Their operations are classified. It's suspected that their primary use is to in the event of war, to cut submarine cables, which 
power the global internet. So Alvin was the first uh, <clears throat> real research submersible launched in 1964. The French launched theirs in 1987. So it took 23 years for another country to actually build a submersible to go to great depths. Japan launched one just two years after that. They built a 2000 meter capable one as a trial platform and then built the stronger one, deeper one a few years later. And then in 2010, China came on the scene with Zhao Long. Um, and because the Japanese one went 6,500 meters, the no teal was 6,000. The Chinese wanted to go a little deeper to claim the prize of the deepest submersible. So theirs goes 7,000 meters. So let's talk a bit about Alvin. Um, it was designed and built in Woods Hole. Parts, parts were fabricated across the United States. It's a titanium sphere um, that houses three people, belongs to Woods Hole, and it's been operated by Woods Hole ever since it entered service you know, more than 50 years ago. <clears throat> its depth capability increased from about 2,500 meters to 4,500 meters in the early 70s. It has been by far the most used submersible on the planet, more than 5,000 dives. And as I said, its depth capability is being increased. They've essentially built a new, stronger titanium sphere to house the people in it and new support systems around that. And that's currently being assembled um, for operations next year. So a few of Alvin's highlights. In the 1960s, it went looking for the two lost nuclear submarines and to recover their weapons. So that, that was the Thresher and the Scorpion. Those of you who are a certain age can probably remember those disasters when those nuclear submarines disappeared. <clears throat> then a hydrogen bomb happened to be uh, let off a plane by accident off the coast of Spain in 1966. Alvin helped recover that. <clears throat> in 67, a swordfish decided it wanted to attack Alvin and it got trapped in Alvin's skin. Um, Alvin made an emergency surface from great depths, well, from 600 meters. Um, the fish was recovered, um, carved up, and eaten. So you can see who won that uh, <clears throat> battle between Alvin and the swordfish. In 68, there was an accident. Uh, the Alvin sank when cables broke during launching. The three crew were able to escape immediately, and it sank to a depth of 1,500 meters with no one aboard. It was recovered in 1969, and from, a, <clears throat> from an edible uh, sandwich point of view, the sandwiches, which had gone down with the ship in plastic containers, were still intact and edible. Um, well, they'd been at about two degrees centigrade or 34 degrees. Um, so the, sand, the peanut butter sandwiches are well-preserved despite being lost for a year. In the 1970s, the <clears throat> Alvin studied the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where new crust is being created by plate tectonics. Uh, similarly, in 1977, a major discovery um, in the Eastern Pacific near the Galapagos Islands uh, discovered hydrothermal vents, these hot springs on the seafloor. And then two years later, found the same things at the East Pacific Rise quite close by. So hot water, very hot water, hundreds of degrees Fahrenheit, 380 degrees centigrade coming out. And this opened a whole new world of biology, um, discovering life forms that didn't need sunlight to survive. They are chemosynthetic. They synthesize chemicals that are coming out of the earth and they, that's their sustenance. In 1986, uh, Bob Ballard took Alvin to the Titanic and explored it. And then much more recently, the Deepwater Horizon disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, Alvin went to monitor and <clears throat> monitor the oil that was coming out of Deepwater Horizon, the sunken um, submersible platform, oil drilling platform, and did follow-up studies. So Alvin weighs, you know, 17 tons. It's about the length of a Boston Whaler runabout, about the same beam. Um, it has a top speed of two knots, um, so it doesn't go very far, you know, three miles at most. It can stay down about 72 hours, so three days, and that's just for safety. It usually just dives during the day from 9 to 5 p.m. and comes up every day and batteries are recharged, um, maintenance is done, the whole thing is inspected. 
to make sure it's safe to dive again the next day. But just in case something happens on the bottom, it has that sort of endurance to stay down three days. Of course, the chances of something else being able to get down there in that amount of time is pretty slim, but at least it gives someone a, a sense of, well, there is some safety margin bit in, built in. And in contrast to some other sub research submersibles, the crew of three is one pilot and two scientific observers. So in, if something should happen to the pilot while it's <clears throat> On its dive, then the scientists know what to do in an emergency. They know how to release the ballast and get the Alvin back up to the surface. So there's training for the scientists on how to do emergency maneuvers. Just a cross section of the Alvin, very similar to you know, the Trieste. There's a, there's a sphere that the people are in. It's at the left-hand side of this, and then all the support systems and propulsion <clears throat> are on the right-hand side. And the business end here where the people are, it's got manipulator arms, it's got uh, portholes, cameras, lights, um, instruments that measure water properties, et cetera. So it's collecting data the whole time it's in the water. In case of emergency, the part of the Alvin with the people in it in the upper half of this diagram can detach from the rest of it and that can float to the surface. And every submersible has a mothership. In the case of Alvin, the current mothership, it, it's had several motherships since 1964 because um, <clears throat> research vessels generally have a lifetime of about 30 years before they're scrapped or sold to another uh, country or given to another country. Uh, this vessel was built in the 1990s and has had a major midlife refit, the Atlantis, but this is the mothership and this A-frame on the stern of the Atlantis is used to deploy and recover Alvin with cables. And if any of you are really intrigued about what the bottom of the seafloor looks like, I'll put in a plug for this book by friends of mine, uh, colleagues, Discovering the Deep, just came out a couple of years ago. Um, Jeff Carson, Dan Fenari, Mike Perfett, Debbie, Debbie Kelly, and Tim Shank are all colleagues of mine I know. Jeff Carson and I have done field work together in the Galapagos and <clears throat> in Iceland. Mike Perfect came to Hobart on a sabbatical with me a few years ago. Dan Frenari and I were at Columbia University together, um, et cetera, et cetera. It's a small global community of marine um, geoscientists, so we all know each other. But this is an excellent book if you're interested in seeing what the deep sea floor looks like. Okay, moving on to the French um, <clears throat> submersible. Now, teal means Nautilus. It also has a titanium sphere. It's uh, run by a French national agency called IFREMER, um, which the unfortunate um, <clears throat> translation is Institute for Exploitation of the Sea. It's not exploration, but exploitation, which doesn't sound so good in English these days. But anyway, they still have that name. It entered service uh, 33 years ago. And it's, as I said earlier, it has a maximum depth capability of 6,000 meters. A few of its achievements, it was also used to explore the Titanic, which sank in nearly 4,000 meters of water in 1912. And it was heavily involved in the search for the Air France flight that um, fell out of the sky <clears throat> off Brazil in 2009 and was eventually located in a fairly small debris field. Uh, this plane, it was an Airbus A330. Actually, well, it was cruising at 30,000 feet. Its um, piton sensors got iced up. Uh, the, the three pilots aboard sort of lost control and it essentially pancaked into the ocean. So the debris field was quite small, but it took a long time to find the black boxes from that flight. I think it was two years after the flight went down, they were actually able to get the black boxes and actually figure what, out what happened. So it's you know, a little bit longer than Alvin, 26 feet versus 23 feet, about the same beam. Um, it's, it's slower, it only goes a knot and a half, and it has a range of seven and a half kilometers, so about four miles. Um, it can stay down for four days, so there's a bit, or five days, there's a built-in um, redundancy bigger than Alvin's there, but it can also go deeper. It also carries three people, and that's, uh, one pilot and two scientists as well. Just a picture of no teal. Um, 
looking at the business end on the lower left hand side there with all the cameras, lights, um, instruments, manipulator arms. Now we turn to Shinkai, 6,500 for 6,500 meters. Shinkai means deep sea or new frontiers in Japanese. Its titanium sphere has, is two meters or six feet in diameter, um, which is similar in size to Notiles and Alvins. They're six feet in diameter as well. Um, it's extremely hard to fabricate these titanium spheres. Um, over that two meter diameter, there's less than half a millimeter discrepancy in the thickness and in the roundness of it. So they have to be extremely round and of uniform thickness so they won't implode at that thousand times atmospheric pressure at the greatest depths. It is run by an organization called JAMSTEC, which is the Japan Agency for Marine Science, Marine Earth Science Technology. Um, it entered service in 1989. It's a little bigger than Alvin and Notiel. It's almost 30 feet long, <clears throat> about the same beam. It's considerably heavier than either the French or the American vehicles. The Japanese are much more risk averse than the French or the Americans. So the Shinkai carries two pilots and one researcher uh, aboard. A normal dive is eight hours and it has five days endurance. It can go about two and a half knots. <clears throat> On the right is kind of a, a schedule of, so usually um, <clears throat> the scientists and the pilots get aboard about eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, the launches start starts diving at nine o'clock in the morning, takes several hours to get down to the seafloor. Uh, you work on the seafloor, depending on the depth. Um, the greater the water depth, the shorter amount of time you have on the seafloor, and then you start to come up in the mid-afternoon, and then you surface just before dinner time. Uh, Cross-section, very similar to the two previous submersibles I showed. People in the titanium sphere here, the business end on the lower left with the manipulator arms, sample baskets, lights, cameras, um, and then the propulsion and ballast in the, and off to the right there, other support systems. So just going through a, a round trip of a dive here. Um, <clears throat> so the dive starts over here on the right, the ballast tank is full of air. You start to get the air out and inject water into the ballast tanks. Um, you jettison weights so there's neutral buoyancy as you go down. <clears throat> you get to the bottom using vertical thrusters. Um, when you get to the bottom, you inject water into the seawater tank. And then when you want to come up, you start expelling um, water. And then you begin your ascent and get to the surface. So eight hours or nine hours of uh, round trip there. Now I'm gonna talk about a dive that I did so more, almost 20 years ago. Um, I'll provide a little bit of geological background why we went there to the, to the location we did. I'll go through the launch, the dive itself, the recovery, and then through some of the data that we acquired and samples. So normally I'd like to show you videos of what we saw on the seafloor, but because of bandwidth issues, um, it was recommended that I not show any videos. So I'm just going to show you still pictures, but maybe in the future years, I'll be able to show you um, video of the seafloor. So we were working off Hawaii. All these green squares indicate locations where the seafloor has been studied, either in person by remotely operated vehicles or by autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, so Hawaii has been the intense focus of many studies. And this was a cooperative Japanese-American program. At the time, I was a Japanese scientist. And <clears throat> it lasted essentially 10 years, mapping the seafloor first, then organizing these dives, and then all the analytical studies on the samples and data we acquired. So the particular dive that I'm going to talk about is off a feature called the Hualalai Ridge. Hualalai is a dormant volcano here in northwestern part of the Big Island of Hawaii. And this ridge extending offshore uh, is a manifestation of the activity of that dormant volcano. It's only been dormant for a couple hundred thousand years. And of course, Hawaii is the, um, the most active of the Hawaiian volcanoes. 
with Mauna Loa and Mauna Kea and Kilauea where Hawaii um, <clears throat> Volcano National Park is. And then new location out here, Loihi Volcano, which is an active submarine volcano. And as you move off to the Northwest, uh, the rocks get older and older. And this is just the Pacific plate moving over a hot spot in the mantle and the hot spots burning through the Pacific plate and generating this chain of volcanoes, which extends all the way up to um, Siberia. So over 5,000 kilometer long volcanic chain getting older and older towards Siberia. Well, first, before we dive, we have to map the seafloor. And this is just a contour map of the seafloor going from about 1,750 meters up here <clears throat> close to the island and then down to greater than 4,000 meters down here. So we need these kind of maps to be able to plan the submersible dive because we can't go very far in a submersible if we want to pick the best locations for acquiring samples. Um, this is in map view, uh, the dive. So we started out here quite a ways offshore and worked our way up the slope of the volcano, the Hualalai Ridge, up to relatively shallow water depth. And this is the depth profile in the upper left here, uh, the relatively rapid descent, which takes a couple of hours, then our work along the seafloor, which took about three hours, then our ascent back up to the surface. Again, rapid compared with how we were moving along the seafloor. And this is just the depth view, so again, the water surface is up here, the ship is up here, going down through the water column on the left to our starting point, and then working our way up the slope of the side of the undersea portion of the Big Island of Hawaii, reaching our termination, and then going back up to the surface. So the whole time we were on the bottom, we were essentially recording nonstop videos, taking samples, taking pictures, and talking, uh, recording data into tape recorders, recording our observations. One of my professors at Columbia University, who's done a lot of dives, I asked him how he prepared for um, <clears throat> submersible dives, a guy named Bill Ryan, um, fairly well-known marine geoscientist. He, he said he would go out with his wife in their car and drive along, <clears throat> say the Palisades Parkway or the Sawmill River Parkway um, for an hour or two hours. And he would look out the window, his wife would be driving, and he'd talk nonstop. He'd observe every pine tree, every deciduous tree, every crack in the pavement. He would just constantly talk and describe what he was seeing. And that's how you prepare for this very valuable time on the seafloor is just constantly talk about what you're seeing. And that's recorded on tape for further study. So this is the camera apparatus on the Shinkai submersible. You know, you need very strong strobe lights, um, still cameras, video cameras. Um, these are the portholes um, on the left and the right <clears throat> through which the observers can look. And then a little farther down, um, we can see the portholes again here on the left and the right. And then two manipulator arms. There's one over here on the left and this one sort of in the center showing, you know, the extendable, much like what's on the space shuttle, what's like on lunar and Martian rovers to extend and pick up samples and put them in these baskets in, the <clears throat> in, in front of them uh, in the lower left here. This is how you get into and out of the submersible, so a fairly narrow entrance way, uh, the hatch down into the submarine, which has a, in the top here, a very thick titanium um, um, seal to it. <clears throat> this is the chief scientist on that voyage, a man who's done many, many dives, the leader of this joint Japanese-American uh, research program off Hawaii, um, Aichi Takahashi um, of the Tokyo Institute of Technology. Tokyo Institute of Technology is kind of the analog in Japan of the Massachusetts uh, Institute of Technology. Um, and because of the unfortunate acronym TIT, they could not call it TIT like MIT does, they call it TI Tech. So it's Tokyo Institute of Technology. Common question I got asked is what if? <clears throat> 
what if you gotta go during those nine hours you're in this submersible? So this is a very friendly Japanese pictogram with um, some material inside just in case you need to use the facilities. And remember, you're in a <clears throat> six foot wide sphere with two other people. So privacy is quite limited. Um, so here's uh, the Shinkai in its hangar in a research vessel called Yokosuka, which is also the name of a, a city south of Tokyo. It's where the big US naval base is in Japan, Yokosuka. Um, so that's where it's stored when it's not in use. And that big A-frame on the back of the ship, we'll see a lot more of that. So we're starting to launch it now. So the A-frame has picked it up. Um, <clears throat> and the A-frame with these huge hydraulic cylinders on the left and the right um, takes it from the fan tail or the aft deck of the ship out over the water and then lowers it into the water. And that process you see here. Um, <clears throat> So everyone's in it at this point, and you get in it before it actually starts the launch procedure. So all three people are aboard. And the launch, as I said, takes about an hour before you can actually dive. So getting back to the facilities, what I do before a dive is <clears throat> I basically don't eat for like 18, I skip dinner be before the dive. I don't drink anything, so I'm extremely dehydrated before um, I get in the submersible and then I just take a lot of mints or lifesavers to sort of suck on and keep your mouth wet during the dive itself. And <clears throat> that's what experienced people, well, very well experienced, much more experienced than I do, do as well. And I took their advice and succeeded <clears throat> without using the friendly Japanese facilities. Uh, the submersible is about to go into the water here. You can see a chase boat uh, just underneath the A-frame on the upper left. Um, that has divers in it, and I'll show you a bit more about them. And then uh, just about as it's being lowered into the water, you get a good view of the manipulator arms, both of them, all the camera um, and lighting apparatus, the portholes, so three of them, one for each person. Uh, the pilot has the forward-facing one, co-pilot has this one, and the scientist has the other one, although the co-pilot and the scientist can change sides depending on what. Of course, changing sides with three people in a six foot diameter sphere is, <clears throat> uh, it's, kind, it's good if you have dance training or contortionist training. So here we're going into the water and you'll see it's attached to the ship by this tow line and also by these really thick cables um, in the top of the slide. Um, <clears throat> that have to be released before you can get going. So that's where the divers come in, two divers for uh, safety, and not just one. Here they are checking to make sure everything's okay, the hatch is sealed, and we're not gonna spring a leak. And here they are detaching these heavy cables from uh, the mothership or the support vessel. And letting go, <clears throat> letting go more, and then finally they're finished, so they're about to dive back in the water and release these tow lines. So now they're at the front of the submersible and they're detaching the tow line from the mothership. And so the submersible is free in this picture. The chase boat's going over to pick up the <clears throat> divers and the dive is about to start. Here you can see it blowing air and taking on water out of one of the ballast tanks. So that kind of looks like a whale spouting. That's similar. The, the submersible is breathing, getting rid of some air. So on, on this dive, uh, Kwama-san was the pilot, Nambu-san was the co-pilot, and we got to be very good friends over nine hours. I'd only met them briefly before, and I've only seen them briefly since, but we became quite close during the dive. So <clears throat> on, the, on the mothership during a dive, there are two scientists who are monitoring the dive the whole time. They're making records of what, they, what the submersible is doing. A very detailed timeline is kept. Um, this is when the submersible is actually on the seafloor. 
when we actually do samples, um, whether they're cores or use the manipulator arms, um, I'm talking and describing what I'm seeing, muddy floor, saw a sea cucumber, um, saw a lot of animal tracks, saw lavas, et cetera, et cetera. So constantly making observations during those few hours on the seafloor. And just to highlight what you're going to see underwater, this is a sub-Antarctic island. I've done some field work and I've had a couple PhD students work on this island. It's about 1,500 kilometers south of New Zealand, south of the South Island. It belongs to Australia. It's called Macquarie Island. And it's a piece of oceanic crust created at a seafloor spreading center, just like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, that's been raised by subsequent tectonic activity above the seafloor. So these are basalts that were created 2,000, 3,000 meters water depth that have subsequently, over the last 10 million years, been uplifted above sea level. And you see these unique shapes. We call these pillow lavas because they do kind of look like pillows. Um, geologists tend to be quite descriptive when we're naming things for the first time. And when we first saw photos of the bottom of the seafloor and saw these, someone said, oh, they look like pillows. Let's call them pillow lavas. Um, biologists were the first people to work on Macquarie Island. So these, these pillow lavas form a hill. And so the biologists call this spaghetti hill for obvious reasons, because it looks like a big pile of spaghetti. Um, so they're even more descriptive than geologists. So here are pillow lavas on the seafloor on my dive. So this is a pillow lava coming from the top and it's broken off. So this is a cross section you see right in the center of the um, image of a pillow lava. Perfect example. And then you see some sediment on the seafloor around it. So this white sediment means that it's um, calcareous sediment. So the, the remains of plankton who've died, foraminifera, um, <clears throat> nano, nanofossils that um, have died and fallen to the seafloor and make sort of this white sand. Um, another nice cross section of a pillow lava here with a starfish on it. Um, <clears throat> so no matter what depth you go to in the ocean, you see life. Um, and I'll show you some more pictures of life as we move on. And again, I wish I could show you videos because they're more dynamic and you can on the videos, you can actually see fish coming in and out and, and things moving. Unfortunately, in these still images, everything's static. Um, so this is a soft coral, again, on top of pillow lavas in the background. Uh, very beautiful, delicate, ornate coral. And then a whole group of anthozoa. So anemones, stony corals, and soft corals all on this rock outcrop. Um, so they're essentially catching things in the water column to live on. They're not photosynthetic, so they're, they're actually capturing things drifting in the water or falling down slope um, to sustain them. Um, up in sort of the shallowest part of the dive, 2,000 meters, life increases the shallower you get. Um, so again, a group of anemones um, and various kinds of coral in the 2,000 meters water depth. This is a coral, but it's kind of covered with these worms that are living on it. Um, and why they choose to live on this, maybe they're um, scraping algae off the coral. Maybe they're actually eating part of the coral. I don't know. Um, but a lot of worms um, hanging out on this particular coral. Again, living on top of this submarine basalt or rock that's formed by volcanic processes. So time for recovery. Uh, what I didn't say in the launch and descent and ascent um, phases previously is it's an extremely aesthetic experience diving in tropical regions and submersibles are basically limited because you see divers are needed where the weather's extremely rough and the roaring 40s and the furious 50s and the howling 60 degrees latitude. Um, it's very, it's nearly impossible to do these submersible operations just because it's not safe in rough weather for the divers to go into the water and detach and reattach uh, the submersible to the mothership. So most diving is done in um, relatively low latitudes, the 30s and closer to the equator. And <clears throat> so the aesthetic experience is when you start to dive, uh, you see this incredible turquoise 
And then as you descend slowly, you go through every shade of blue, darker and darker and darker, until there's absolutely no light at all, and it's completely black. And you can't distinguish between <clears throat> the darkest blue and the black at depths. And that's just at a few hundred meters, generally 800 meters in extremely clear tropical waters like off Hawaii. And then you have the reverse experience coming back up. You see the first sort of glimmers of the darkest of blues at several hundred meters. And then as you ascend, the blues just get lighter and lighter and lighter as you move up towards the surface. So <clears throat> otherwise, you're completely in the dark during the descent and ascent. You just have the lights off to conserve electrical power and battery life. Um, and you and the other two are just sitting together in the sphere for several hours going down and several hours coming up in near complete darkness. So the reverse of what you saw in the launch, so you attach the tow line to the ship, to, to the submersible. <clears throat> the divers go in and you can see it's a little rougher uh, on this, some white caps out there. So, and their job when the submersible is rocking and rolling and the three people inside the submersible are rocking and rolling and have very full bladders, um, <clears throat> are anxious to get on the ship. Um, first come down these wires from the upper right here <clears throat> uh, to attach initially to the two points. And the divers are checking to make sure everyone's okay inside. Uh, <clears throat> they attach these cables, both cables, <clears throat> and then they finish their work. So you can imagine if we had, say, 30-foot waves in the parts of the ocean where I normally work and where I talked about last summer, um, <clears throat> the Furious 50s, uh, this just would not be possible. Probably the submersible would be rocking and rolling and possibly turning upside down. Uh, the divers just couldn't work in those conditions. <clears throat> here we are just emerging from the water with our sampling baskets in the lower right here that are full, um, all the uh, camera data and tape recorder data, still camera recorded <clears throat> on hard drives or other media. And then finally coming aboard and the three people on board, their first priority is to run to the facilities on the ship. So that's the end of the, <clears throat> end of the dive. So through the course of a dive, this is again a map, a bathymetric map. These are contour lines of the seafloor. So we're able to plot the location of the submersible along the seafloor. And where we've stopped here is where we've done considerable amount of sampling. So on this particular dive, I think I, I took about 40 samples uh, <clears throat> and put them in the baskets. So I basically filled all the baskets and we took push cores uh, where we take sediment samples using small cores. Um, so all these dark black areas from the start down here to the end of the dive on the upper right are sample locations. And then there's all kinds of paperwork to fill out. So this is just a report from my particular dive. Uh, <clears throat> for those of you who study Japanese, this is my name in Japanese. I'm in katakana, maiku kofu en, Michael kofin san. <clears throat> and so this is a dive report from um, <clears throat> my dive. So just sort of summarizing the important stuff. Um, so, and this is all available online. Uh, the people who study rocks, and I'm not a person who studies rocks per se, so the people on the ship, the scientists on the ship, this is a colleague of mine, uh, Takeshi Hanyu, Hanyu-san, who <clears throat> is a petrologist. So they describe the rocks, uh, the rock characteristics, color, how many vesicles they have or holes, void space, whether they're altered or not, whether they have a manganese crust on them, whether there are uh, crystals, um, whether there's glass, uh, try to characterize the type of rock it is, like this called a picritic basalt, for example. And this is done for each and every one of the samples that I collected. And if you're really curious, um, JAMSTEC has a publicly accessible library of deep sea images from all the Shinkai dives, which now number over a thousand. You can go to this website or just Google JAMSTEC e Library of Deep Sea Images and watch videos to your heart content. You can watch the full, you know, 
nearly four hours we were on the seafloor. You can watch videos of the whole thing. Um, and also there's a hundreds if not thousands of still photos available as well. So we were nearly five hours on the bottom story. Time flies when you're having fun. And this is just an example of one of the videos and you can play it online if you have sufficient bandwidth. You can download it um, for watching if you <clears throat> need uh, something to help you get to sleep at night and just want to watch the ocean floor go by very slowly. You can watch it on your iPad. <clears throat> very sort of calming unless you have claustrophobia. So now we go on to the Chinese vehicle, the Jiaolong, uh, the translation of which means sea dragon. Uh, the I work quite a bit with Chinese scientists as well as Japanese scientists, and they're very fond of naming their ships some sort of dragon. So they named their uh, submersible the Sea Dragon, and their icebreaker that comes to Hobart and services the Antarctic stations for China, that's called the Snow Dragon. So dragons are big in Chinese ship names. That's also a titanium sphere. It's a little bit bigger than Qinghai's and Alvin's and Nautil's. It's run out of Qingdao, which is north of Shanghai along the coast. It's right across from North Korea. I teach every year in Qingdao at Ocean University of China. It's their main marine science, as well as their main Chinese Navy, People's Navy base. Um, and Qingdao is also famous because it's where the uh, summer 2008 Olympic sailing events were held. A very sea-friendly city. And as I said, they wanted to go a little deeper than anyone else, so they built it to go to 7,000 meters, but especially the Japanese. They wanted to go deeper than the Japanese. So it's um, a little bit smaller than Shinkai, uh, 22 tons, so a bit lighter. It, like Alvin, has one pilot and two scientists. Um, it has a three-day contingency that normally just operates you know, dur during daylight hours in one day has all the same sorts of um, technology. Um, it's interesting, they planned building Jiaolong with a lot of US technology, but as they were building it, the politics got rougher and rougher and they were denied access to a lot of US technology. So it actually drove the Chinese to develop a lot of this technology in their own country. Um, so sort of a premonition of what's happening now as nationalism um, grows and the trade barriers grow. Construction, you know, they looked at Chinkai, they looked at Notil, they looked at Alvin, same sort of deal uh, here on the right, the pressure hall with the people in it, the rest of its support systems, the business end with the manipulators, the sample baskets, the um, other instruments, cameras, <clears throat> On the, on the front end of it. Uh, There's a picture of Jiao Long, looks very much like Shinkai, except the writing on the side is in kanji, not in katakana. Two manipulator arms, just like Alvin and Notil and, and Shinkai. Sample baskets here in the front, three portholes, so very similar design. A lot of lights and cameras. and its mothership here um, and launching Zhao Long. So now I'm gonna to turn to human occupied vehicles that are, have been developed by the private sector. And the two most notable of these are the ones James Cameron, the famous film director, Deep Sea Challenger, which <clears throat> was designed and built in Australia, which Australians are very proud of. And then Limiting Factor, which was built, commissioned by the private equity and back investor Victor Vescovo here in the US. First, James Cameron um, <clears throat> um, in his mid 60s, uh, very wealthy guy, thanks to the Terminator movies, Titanic, Avatar. He got interested in the deep sea. He made you know, the Titanic film and actually dove on the Titanic in a Russian submersible. He found the Bismarck and with Bob Ballard and he dove on that in Mir and he built, had built the vessel Deep Sea Challenger to go to the deepest place in the ocean, Challenger Deep. And this was a collaboration with National Geographic. And out of that came a feature length movie, Deep Sea Challenger 3D. So <clears throat> it was launched in 2012. Um, it's quite a bit lighter 
uh, than the research submersibles I talked about, about the same length, um, a little faster, and has an endurance of just basically two days. The main difference is it just carries one person. So this was a solo um, vehicle for James Cameron to get to the deep greatest depths. And the sphere that he was in was much smaller, so only three feet in diameter. Um, and so not very comfortable, can't even stretch out in that. Um, and 64 millimeters thick, so several inches thick. After he used it, and he, I'll say, he was fortunate to get back because he had a number of systems failures on that dive. And one of my master's, former master's students was his communications director on the support ship. So I was getting sort of inside information before it was publicly released. And I, I would say it's safe to say that this was a pretty hairy um, experience for James Cameron. You know, hydraulics failed when he was on the bottom. Um, he had to depart early without taking much in the way of scientific samples. So after that dive, he donated the vehicle to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And this is the vehicle at Woods Hole. Again, I have a position there. So I was able to <clears throat> look it all over and rub my hands all over it and see what it, you know, see what this vehicle was actually like. Um, <clears throat> and so he donated to Woods Hole. Woods Hole figured it was unusable so they were kind of anxious to get it out of their storage area. Um, oh, this is a support ship that it was on, the Mermaid Sapphire, so a, a chartered ship. And this is it, I think, coming out of the water after its dive with flotation on it. It had a few test dives before it actually went, but nowhere near as deep as um, Challenger Deep. But then Woods Hole was sending it to an exhibition and on the Connecticut Turnpike, it caught fire. Actually, the truck caught fire and it burned up part of the Deep Sea Challenger. Um, it was subsequently repaired, but I, I would safe to say it's not safe to go to any depths now. It's mainly a museum piece. And it was sent to Australia and it, uh, the Maritime Museum of Sydney had it on exhibition um, for <clears throat> several months, um, actually a year. Uh, in May, let's see, that was 2019, so just over a year ago. I don't know where this vehicle is now. I suspect it's somewhere in Australia. And just to finish up, um, I'll talk about Victor Vescovo. So he's a private equity investor. He's a real uh, explorer extraordinaire. He's done what's called the Grand Slam or the last degree. He's climbed the seven highest peaks on seven continents. He's skied the last degree of latitude at both the North and South Poles, and he has now been to the deepest points in five oceans. And there's in his, the submersible he developed, and there's a Discovery Channel program about him called Five Deeps. And there was a New Yorker article about the Five Deeps expedition just back in May called 36,000 Feet Under the Sea. And if you haven't read it, it presents sort of a popular view of the dive. I'm gonna go be a more scientific and um, technical part uh, than what's described in this New York article. But I, I think the article is really well done, so I can recommend it. So the name of his submersible is Limiting Factor and the name of his uh, support ship is Pressure Drop. And these are named after, he's a science fiction fan, so they're named after spacefaring uh, vessels that uh, were published by the Scottish author Ian Banks in his culture series. And the motto of his expedition is in profundo cognito or in the deeps knowledge. So his vehicle has a one and a half meter or about a four and a half foot diameter sphere. Um, it was built by a company in Florida called Triton, entered in service in 2018, and it can go to the greatest ocean depths. And it was planned originally after this five deeps expedition that he would sell this to someone um, but that plan changed. So this is the vehicle, um, and this is actually commercially produced, so you can buy one if you want one and go to the greatest ocean depths. Of course, you need a support vessel too, so you can't just buy the submersible. It only carries two people. Of course, it has a smaller sphere, titanium sphere. And if you want one, uh, the submersible itself is about 50 million. Um, <clears throat> 
Again, it can go to the greatest depths. It only has about a 16 hour endurance, so it doesn't have all the support and redundancy that the research submersibles do. The support vessel is a recycled US Navy spy ship. Um, Vescovo served in the US Navy and he's had connections with the Navy, so he bought this ship surplus um, and refitted it to be a mothership. He also constructed what we call landers, and these are like landers on Mars or on the moon, sort of autonomous vehicles that go down to the greatest depths, collect various types of data and samples, and come back up again. Um, they aren't attached to the submersible or to the mothership. Um, cameras, um, biological sampling boxes, the ability to push. So a much more scientific approach than James Cameron took. I mean, James Cameron, it was basically just a round trip he wanted to make um, as, a, as, a, as a trip to the deepest part of the ocean. Um, there are also autonomous systems. So because Vescovo has a scientific bent, he wanted to know exactly how deep these spots in the oceans were. Now that's not as simple as it sounds. You know, in the old days, you put a lead line over the side of a ship and just measured how much line you had over. That's extremely difficult when the water's more than six miles deep. So we use acoustics to um, sense, but the velocity of sound in water is a function mainly of its temperature and its salinity. So how much salt's in the water and what the temperature of the water is. So the CTDs that he took with him measure the temperature profile as you go down through the whole water column. And they also measure conductivity, which is a proxy for salinity. The conductivity of seawater is a function of how much salt is in it. So we translate conductivity into salinity. So he wanted to be sure he'd reached and what the exact depth was of these deepest spots in the five oceans. And these landers also had um, samplers for water and microbes and to take cores. These are pictures of the landers, so fairly sizable devices that are essentially dropped into the water and free fall down to the seafloor. So the Five Deeps expedition, which if you read the New Yorker article, you'll see there was a long sort of <clears throat> uh, many delays in, in its setting off. It started here in the Atlantic, the deepest place in the Atlantic, the Puerto Rico Trench. Then they went down into the Southern Ocean, which is the South Sandwich Trench. Then they went over to the Indian Ocean, and it wasn't clear where the deepest part in the Indian Ocean was. So a part of the ocean that I was working in in January through March this year, off Southwest Australia, uh, they went there because that could have been the deepest place. Um, and it, it turned out to be only 100 meters shallower than this up here in the trench off Indonesia. Um, so that this, they didn't dive here, they just mapped the seafloor. And then they went here and dove. Then they went over to the deepest part in the Pacific Ocean. And then they came back across the Pacific and went up to the Arctic and dove in the deepest place there. So a year long expedition to go to these five deepest places in the ocean. So over 8,000 meters in the Atlantic, 7,500 meters in the Southern Ocean, over 7,000 meters <clears throat> in the Indian Ocean. And again, not much difference in these two spots. And then multiple deep spots, so the Challenger Deep being the deepest one in the Pacific. And then this relatively shallow one, the Malloy Deep in the Arctic. So Victor went to all of those. And over the course of that expedition in 10 months, uh, they sailed 47,000 nautical miles. They mapped, um, you know, three times the area of Maine, uh, 39 dives, the landers went down and back 50 times. No human had ever been to the bottom of several of these trenches. <clears throat> and no submersible had ever been to the Challenger Deep more than once. And no person had ever been both to the summit of Everest and to the bottom of Challenger Deep. So he set many records in this. He didn't manage to sell the vehicle, uh, the <clears throat> um, vehicle or the mothership. So he embarked on another expedition this year. He started in the Mediterranean, diving on a French submarine that was lost. And he is a guy with a heart because he took the son of the commander of that French submarine on that expedition. And I neglected to mention 
when he dove to Challenger Deep in 2019, he took Don Walsh, the Navy guy who'd been down there in 1960 in the Trieste on the expedition. So he has, he has a nostalgia and a sentimentality that's admirable in these times. And then they proceeded east um, in these various locations and they dove in Challenger Deep again this past June. And just to sum up, so 12 people had been to the moon, uh, walked on the moon. <clears throat> um, I had the good fortune, only one of these was a geologist, Harrison Schmidt, on the very last Apollo expedition to the moon. I had the good fortune to spend a week at the Johnson Space Center a while ago, and I talked at length with John Young about his experiences on the moon. And it turns out that all these astronauts were trained in geology by a <clears throat> University of Tasmania professor, or University of Texas professor where I used to work, Bill Mulberger. Um, so all the, very few of them had, had studied any geology at all, but NASA required that they study some geology. So John Young had some real insights. He asked me a lot of interesting geology questions when I talked with him. And up until this year, fewer than 12 people had been to the bottom of Challenger Deep. So again, the two people in Trieste in 1960, James Cameron in 2012, and then this whole slew of people um, last year and this year. So Victor, of course, first and also climbed Everest. Um, members of his team last year, his chief scientist, the guy who designed the submersible, his operations officer. Um, and then this year, when he went back, he took the astronaut Kathy Sullivan. She was the first woman to walk in space for the US. Um, she went down first. Then Vanessa O'Brien, a dual UK US citizen. She'd also climbed Everest. Then he took another guy who climbed Everest. Then he took the son of Don Walsh, who'd been down there in 1940. He took Kelly Walsh down to the bottom. He took the first Asian. Uh, a, a Taiwanese colleague of mine at Woods Hole, Yin Song Yin. And then he took a private equity investor, Jim Whittington, down also. So now, finally, more people have been to the bottom of the ocean than have worked, the deepest part of the ocean, than have walked on the moon. So I'll finish there. I'll just highlight. So this is on the lower left, that's me um, sometime during a dive that dive I showed <clears throat> inside the submersible. And in the back of the submersible here, I'm on the right in a younger, <laughs> younger rendition of myself with Professor Julia Hammer from the University of Hawaii. She's done most of the work on the samples that I collected and published quite a few papers on, on the results of the analyses of those rocks. So that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mike. That was great. That was so fascinating. Um, so folks who have questions, I think we're a small enough group that people should be able to just unmute yourself and shout out a question if you want. Or we are recording this to post online later. So if you're shy about asking a question um, and being recorded, you can also type it into the chat box and I'll just read it out so you can maintain anonymity. But I think Donald Hill, you, you look like you had something to say. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious, oh, go ahead. do you always have a specific objective when you go down or is it sometimes a mission of discovery? Yeah, the scientific objectives can vary. As I mentioned, Alvin's been down more than 5,000 times. Sometimes it focuses on biology. Some, most of the time it focuses on biology. Some of the time it focuses on geology. Sometimes so it's pure exploration, sometimes it's hypothesis testing. So yeah, a whole variety of scientific reasons why we go down. Thank you. Yeah. Mike? Go ahead. Yeah. Am I on? Yeah. You're on. Uh, Mike, you, you mentioned the fish. You got any good fish stories? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, the Alvin one is the best, the swordfish attacking Alvin. Um, fish and, well, any animals, uh, squid, you know, cephalopods, seem to be attracted to the lights when we're on the bottom. 
So we tend to draw life towards us, and whether it's these sort of ratfish or squid or you know, tiny hagfish, yeah, there's, they, they, they come in and they come in and out of view, but they seem to be attracted by the light. And I think I read recently a figure that something like 95% of deep sea fauna have the ability to generate their own light and whether that's to lure food or to distract predators or to find mates, we just, there's just not been enough studies to know why they, so many of them, so many species generate light. But, you know, that's, that's the main observation that they tend to be attracted um, to the submersible when the lights are on. Thank you. Mike, when I saw Dr. Ballard years ago, one of the most remarkable things I thought he talked about were the fissures that were down deep and how hot the water was coming out of those. Have you observed any of that? On my diving experience, I've not gone down to a mid-ocean ridge where you see that kind of activity. Um, I would love to do that someday, uh, but I haven't. And as you say, the temperatures are extremely high because of the confining pressure. You can get high above the sea level boiling point down there in terms of temperature. So I think the maximum temperature that's been recorded is close to 400 degrees C. And <clears throat> you know, when, when they first, when submersibles first went down there, they didn't know, they hadn't, they hadn't taken any temperature measurements. They just saw this sort of um, fire hose of material First, they saw these black smokers, so it was black material. And when they first stuck a thermometer into it, the thermometer melted. And then they got thermometers that could measure higher and higher temperatures, and the thermometers still kept melting. Um, so finally, they got thermometers that are used for, you know, in steel factories, for example. And, you know, they stuck them in and saw that it was hundreds of degrees. And in those early dives, they actually went quite close with the submersibles because they didn't know. They, they just didn't realize how hot it was. And in some cases, they actually warped some of the plastic on the submersible because of those high temperatures. But the temperatures, those high temperatures dissipate really quickly because the average temperature of the ambient seawater, and there's just so much ambient seawater around, is generally between one and two degrees C, so in the low 30s Fahrenheit. And so that and those high temperatures don't go very far. You know, a foot away from those black smokers, it can be two degrees centigrade, so. Mike, what have been the main scientific uh, outcomes of these dives? Of my dives off Hawaii or the overall? In general. In general? Um, well, I kind of summarized those with the Alvin dives because the Alvin is done by far the most. So I think the most significant, and, and Bob Ballard has told me this and told many other, others, is the discovery of this chemosynthetic life um, at these hot sea events along the mid-ocean ridges. So that's an analog for the kind of life we're looking at on other planets. Um, <clears throat> and in planets, other planets that have oceans and other moons, moons that have oceans. So looking for this sort of chemosynthetic life. So there's a lot of we're, we, the marine geoscience community in general, is working with space agencies around the world to devise experiment, experiments to try and figure out how to identify active life. And you may have seen recently that some drilling was done beneath the South Pacific gyre oh, 10 years ago now. And they recovered sediment that was 100 million years old. And they managed to coax microbes in that 100 million year old sediment back to life. So whatever had been living there for 100 million years, when it got enough food and <clears throat> nutrients and oxygen, it would grow again. So that has, that discovery, or it was just published within the last six weeks, has really stimulated the space community to say, gee, if we went to Mars, could we discover you know, billion year old or three or three or four billion year old life there that's just been dormant ever since and just needs some nurturing to come back. So that's probably the most 
significant discovery of all these deep sea dives that have been undertaken. But in terms of understanding you know, what's living at great depths, what the geology of the seafloor is, we've also made huge, huge advances in, in understanding um, deep ocean life and, and how the morphology of the seafloor develops and what the history of the seafloor is. So, yeah. But I, I should have mentioned that, you know, having a, just like putting people into space, it's so much cheaper and easier to put autonomous vehicles or robots into space. You don't need all the life support systems. So, you know, all the vehicles that countries have sent to Mars, especially over the last few months, you know, there are no people going to Mars yet, all these remote vehicles. And that's the general trend in the ocean. There have been more submersibles, like Russia has deactivated its two scientific submersibles, the Mirs, that also explored Titanic and found the Kursk, the sunken Ru Russian submarine. Um, so the trend is towards autonomous vehicles in the ocean. And we actually did have a question in the chat, Mike, about what were the conclusions specifically from your Hawaii dive? Um, so the work that's come out of the whole suite of diving around Hawaii is that on the active island, there are several, there's, there's Mauna Loa, which is active, there's Kilauea, which is active, Mauna Kea, which is dormant, but has been active within the last 100,000 years. So it's, we, in geological terms, we consider that active. And it looks like there's a zone, a zoning of the, of the chemistry of the rocks. There's a central zone sort of around the cores of those volcanoes. Um, Sensu Lato, the whole, the whole island itself. And then outside those is another type of chemistry of the basalts. And that's, that's been a very intriguing um, discovery. And our work sort of confirmed that Hualai Ridge is part of this outer zone of, um, of, of a chemical type. And we don't know why that is. We're sort of developing hypotheses for why that is, but uh, I wouldn't. Uh, the the truth is still in the making with that. Like, what are the unanswered questions? Unanswered questions. So <laughs> only <laughs> only a few spots. Even though we've done a, you know all these submersibles perhaps a total of 7,000 dives have been made, but each of the dives only goes a few kilometers along the seafloor and only 15% of the ocean floor has been mapped. So there's huge room for discovery. Um, who knows, you know, who knows what we've, one of, the, one of the interesting things from the biological work is we don't understand how, uh, because, the lifespan of these deep sea hydrothermal systems we think is relatively short. And we've, we've gone down enough now, we see ones that have died. And all these tube worms and, and eyeless shrimp and, and corals that were living are dead. They're, they're, it's just a graveyard. When, they, when these systems shut off, they, they probably get plugged up like at Yellowstone. You, know, you plug up one of these geysers and guys are migrate somewhere else. So, <clears throat> so how they find a new hot spot, a new hot vent on the seafloor, we just don't know. And there seem to be biogeographical provinces. So if you go along the global mid-ocean ridge system, you'll see, for example, in the Pacific, Western Pacific, a certain ecosystem of, flo of flora and fauna that's different from the ones you see in the Atlantic that's different than the one you see in the Southern Ocean, that's different than the one you see in the Indian Ocean. So even though there is some overlap um, of species in the communities, they are distinct ecosystems. And I think the more of the mid-ocean ridge we examine, the more we'll be able to understand how these um, life forms actually migrate along the crests of the ridge and, and find new places to live and mates to mate with. And yeah, it's, it's, there's just so much left to understand and explore. You think a lot of that will be planned or will it be serendipity? Um, 
just getting science funded these days requires a rigorous peer review um, <clears throat> iteration uh, proposals. So I think more and more science is hypothesis testing driven. Um, so aside from these private expeditions, um, publicly funded science tends to be more and more um, sort of rigorous in testing various hypotheses, whereas it's, it's, that balance has gradually switched from serendipity to more and more rigorous hypothesis testing. The private, the private vehicles, of course, they can go wherever they want and do whatever they want. So whatever Victor Vescova wants to do, he can go and do it. And he's got scientists involved in his program. So you know, that's a chance for serendipity to come through. Anybody else have any last questions? At the greater depths, are there um, currents or is it fairly just uh, placid? That depends where you are, but in general, there are currents throughout the yep. global ocean at all depths. Uh, we define sort of the physical oceanography of the oceans by various water masses. For example, most of the bottom water in the global ocean is formed off Antarctica. So we're very close to the Antarctic continent where the water is essentially super cooled and super cooled water is denser than all other water. So the coldest water on the planet forms around Antarctica. That sinks rapidly and gradually spreads throughout the global ocean. It doesn't go into the Arctic because there are barriers there, but throughout the Atlantic, Pacific and Indian Ocean, that Antarctic bottom water as we call it spreads, then there's Antarctic intermediate water above that, then there's North Atlantic deep water above that, the North Atlantic deep water is formed as it implies in the North Atlantic, Norwegian Greenland Sea, and then it flows south. <clears throat> and <clears throat> if you were to go several thousand meters water depth off the Gulf of Maine, you would see at the very bottom, the Antarctic bottom water, and above that would be North Atlantic deep water, above that Antarctic intermediate water, and then shallower waters, water bodies above that. And those water masses are defined by their temperature and salinity characteristics. So the whole ocean is moving and <clears throat> some places like off Maine, the Labrador current is colliding with the Gulf Stream and, and that produces turbulence and eddies and mixing. So it's a very dynamic, uh, you know, at rates of up to a few knots. So <clears throat> it's not like the atmosphere where hundreds of knots are sometimes encountered, but it's much more massive. And since the oceans <clears throat> uh, have 95% of the heat content of the ocean atmosphere system, the oceans are extremely important in regulating the global climate. So, so this circulation of water in the global ocean, it, it, I mean, it really um, sort of controls the Earth's climate. Thank you. So that raises the question of um, what's happening in terms of the change of those currents. I mean, what are we seeing now and, and particularly in, in relationship to climate change? We're seeing a lot of changes. Uh, <clears throat> some of the most significant changes are off Antarctica, so everyone's probably aware that the various glaciers and ice sheets in Antarctica are grounded in places. So even though they extend out into the ocean, they're sitting on the seafloor and that's essentially holding the land-based part of the ice sheet or glacier um, on land and not allowing it to flow into the ocean. Uh, probably the most significant discovery there is that the water underneath those ice sheets and glaciers on the continental shelf of Antarctica is warming. And that warming is melting those glaciers from below. And that raises the possibility that these ice sheets and glaciers could surge out into the ocean and raise sea level. And that's why there's so much uncertainty about IPCC uh, sea level predictions is we just don't know how quickly that could happen 
I mean, it's predicted that sea level will be up to a meter higher uh, by the end of this century or three feet higher. But <clears throat> you know, the West Antarctic ice sheet has seven meters of sea level in it, so over 20 feet. Um, if that were to let loose, uh, it, we just don't know how quickly sea level would rise 20 feet. Greenland is also um, suffering from extreme amount of melting the ice there. That's another 20 feet of sea level there if, if all the ice on Greenland were to melt. So those, those are some of the most significant changes um, related to sea level. In terms of ocean currents, there's been concern that um, <clears throat> the North Atlantic conveyor, the Gulf Stream system is weakening um, and that a flood of fresh water would essentially turn down or nearly turn off this meridional circulation of the Gulf Stream and its gyre around the um, North Atlantic. And that would have drastic consequences for the climate of, of Europe um, because the Gulf Stream now keeps Europe warm. If that conveyor belt were to turn down or close off, then <clears throat> you know London's at what, 52 degrees north? That's <laughs> and Oslo's at 60 degrees north, those European countries would get a lot colder very quickly um, and with tremendous implications for refugees, for agriculture, um, for civilization in that part of the world. So th th that's a big concern. Uh, another concern is a de decrease, uh, that's been observed, is a decreasing amount of oxygen in the Southern Ocean. We don't know why that's happening but uh, uh, for whatever reason, and you know, so, so life, most animal life in the ocean relies on oxygen. You know, when, a, when an ocean goes anoxic, all the fish die. Why the Southern Ocean is, is becoming, or is losing oxygen, we, we haven't figured out yet, but it's an observation that's borne out by data. So th those are just a couple of observations, you know, that are of concern. Thank you. Well, on the cheery note of climate change, <laughs> perhaps we want to wrap up for tonight. Great. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much, Mike, and um, and everyone for coming. And um, I'll I'll post this video probably tomorrow and send it out to everyone who was on the registration list, so you can share it with your friends and relive the memories. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Anna, and thanks everyone for joining tonight. Yeah, thank Mike, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Have a good night, everybody. You thanks. too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.